video and uh, PowerPoint are um, designed to augment the uh, final part of chapter 10 in the special senses. I have a few review slides for you and then I will uh, move into um, uh, primarily a little bit of balance and then uh, into uh, the visual section of this chapter. So uh, if uh, for some reason I'm repeating what you had uh, in lecture, um, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, Scroll forward if you feel like it, uh, or otherwise just uh, enjoy the, the show. One thing I would like to emphasize, part of the reason why we spend so much time on special senses and so forth, is due to the fact that they are so much a part of our existence. Um, so when you're treating patients or, or you're dealing with people that you care about and so forth, uh, part of our quality of life is how we perceive it. So, uh, for example, we're moving into the winter season here, and this is uh, in Quebec City uh, near Montreal. They actually pave over the, the normal walking paths with water to create these ice paths in the city park there. So it's absolutely beautiful. And I think a lot of our quality of life is certainly our, uh, how we approach life, our attitude, uh, our, our, our state of being in terms of our mood but also in terms of how we experience things. So um, in your interactions with patients and clients and, and uh, those whom yourselves and those who you may care about, um, uh, attention to how we perceive is, I think, an important adjunct in, a, in and above whatever it is you might be doing to uh, help with their deficit or their problems. Um, just a little bit about olfaction. Again, the, the key point with these slides is that um, olfaction and taste and so forth are metabotropic. Um, a lot of our special senses are metabotropic. And the big exception is, um, is our hearing and balance. Uh, hearing and balance equilibrium are uh, ionotropic responses as opposed to metabotropic. But in the case of olfaction, we have G-protein coupled receptors. And moving into the next slide, when it comes to taste, it turns out that um, we have five major tastes, but these are also uh, metabotropic. Uh, they are GPCRs, uh, like mentioned, in the olfactory system. Um, what's interesting about gustation that is a little bit different than the other ones is that a lot of the other ones are, are believed to be uh, neuronal in nature. Um, in the case of gustation, it is actually non-neural epithelium that are, that are our taste receptors. So a little bit of a deviation here. And I think that these little factoids help us to kind of discriminate between the different senses. Turns out we only have five major flavors, whereas we have literally trillions of different smells. And that's, that just blows me away. Um, one more little thing I'd like to emphasize here with umami. Umami is a sort of peppery, savory flavor that has a lot of notoriety um, because um, for decades now there's been an urban myth about um, uh, sodium, uh, uh, glut uh, yeah, sodium glutamate. Um, that is to say MSG, monosodium glutamate, uh, which is actually patently false because glutamate is in fact an amino acid. We use it all the time. It's, a neuro, it's involved in neurotransmitters. So this, you know, is it possible there's an allergy? Un, yeah, unlikely. Um, doesn't mean there isn't. You know, I've seen people put water on their skin and develop a rash. I mean, you know, what are you going to say to that? But in any case, um, the things to remember about taste are that the different different types of tastes. Um, they are non-neural. Uh, they, again, they're metabotropic, just like smell, uh, just like vision. Um, you can develop specific uh, appetites to these things. Uh, they, uh, these things tend to drive um, complex behaviors and psychologies, uh, cravings, those sorts of things. Just to give you a perspective on, on what makes this so interesting, probably the world's first millionaires were uh, these folks that were creating and uh, importing what we call fish sauce. Uh, that's, that's this one right here. These, these fish stocks um, are actually uh, uh, high in glutamate. They are high in sodium glutamate. They are contributing to the umami the flavor. They are flavor enhancers. And so, like I said, the world's first millionaires were probably these Romans who were catching fish and then fermenting them in these jars 3,000 years ago.
uh, a little review on the hearing and balance. Uh, in terms of the mechanism of hearing and balance, you have these hair cells. These are mechanoreceptors, and they are ionotropic. Uh, just uh, so when we see no sound, we actually have what we call a basal tone. Uh, muscle tone is a similar phenomenon. Muscle tone is the firing of muscle fibers in order to sustain um, a, a condition of readiness. What we mean by tone is how often something fires off. If it has a low tone, it has a very low frequency. If it has a high tone, it has a high frequency. So when we are um, in, a, in a quiet situation, what we have is a very, very low tone of action potentials. However, when we uh, receive uh, sound, or in the case of our uh, semicircular canals and, and uh, vestibules, when these hair cells get deflected either left or right, they cause an opening and closing phenomenon that causes more depolarization, which means faster frequency potentials, and then less depolarization means less, and so we start alternating back and forth. And that's in, in, in tandem with population coding is how we perceive sound. Um, something that uh, Katie didn't talk about that I just want to talk about for a second is how can we discriminate between pitches and so forth. It turns out that we have hair cells along this basilar membrane, and the membrane actually has varying thicknesses. So down here where it's very, very thin, it has a low vibration frequency. So if you were to, to experience a low sound, it would be near this end, and near the upper end, where it's very, very thick and stiff, it has a high vibration frequency. And so, again, population coding is driving our, our perception of um, uh, pitches, uh, low and high, based on which uh, hair cells are being uh, deflected. So we get this deflection going on where the hair cells are being pushed against that tectorial membrane. I have a feeling, I, I'm not sure, but I have a feeling that you're seeing sort of a, um, a, a tuning fork-like phenomenon here, that these guys are actually moving together like a tuning fork would, rather than one vibrating or another. The fluid wave is coming in. It's probably causing some vibrations here, certainly causing some vibrations on the basal or membrane, causing those hair cells to be deflected back and forth. And we see hair cell deflection in either the semicircular canals with the fluid or with the uh, gravitropic crystals um, in the uh, utricles and saccules. So here's the gravitropic phenomenon. The redistribution of these crystals on different hair cells or the pattern of hair cells that are triggered leads to perceptions of head tilt or and or head. Occasionally, people will get these otolith crystals misplaced. That's one of the common causes of uh, nystagmus that we looked at in our lab, is the inappropriate distribution of crystals. And there are some techniques for moving the head and, and uh, whipping it around in order to get these otolith crystals back in their proper locations. Moving into the eye and vision, we're going to talk about some basic phenomena in the eye. And again, eyes are so unbelievably important in our society and in our human existence that I am going to spend a little more time than just the basic physiology, if you know what I mean, because I believe this class serves more than just a pure training purpose for, for your careers. Um, this is one where you can really make a difference in other people's lives, whether they're your clients or your kids or yourself um, and so forth. So I am, that's why I spend a little more time on eyes. We certainly have, it's, it's an optical phenomenon. That is to say, we're using light rays. We're going to be focusing them. Why? Because we're generating a, a facsimile of what we are observing on the inner surface of the eye, and that requires appropriate focal length and, and so forth. Uh, because light rays do change in the angle at which they enter the eye. We have to be able to sort of um, uh, filter that in a proper way, filter, adjust it so that uh, we're always perceiving something in focus and that is relatively realistic to our external environment. So we have these photoreceptors, and near the end of this lecture, we're going to go through the photoreceptor mechanism. Again, it's a metabotropic type mechanism, uh, really meant to be sort of the model system of the metabotropic response in special cells. 
special senses, excuse me. Um, we do a lot of neural processing. In fact, uh, the highest order of neural process, processing is believed to be the visual center. When we say we have great vision, if you talk about a leader with great vision or somebody who can see through an issue or people who, you know, we always describe high levels of intellectual or shall we say visionary uh, thought in terms of our ability to see, not only in terms of what we see with our eyes, but how we can visualize it in our minds. So there's a very a great deal that we have yet to learn about this side of the processing of visual. Um, I don't want to get too much into the anatomy here. I am just going to talk a few things about this in the fundal image on the next slide. Really, we just have to have four major structures that we should understand in terms of uh, basic function. That includes the lens. We're going to bend the light using the lens and a little bit of the cornea. Uh, we have a blind spot here. This is where our neural pathways uh, leave the eye to go to the central nervous system. We have a, a, a retinal layer that includes uh, neural cells as well as epithelial cells. And lastly, we have this uh, very interesting uh, type of uh, smooth muscle called a ciliary muscle. It's a circular donut uh, of muscle that involves uh, stretching and relaxing um, the lens in order to adjust its focal length. On the fundus itself or on the retina, uh, here's the optic disc over here. Um, this is the, the blind spot. This is There are no photoreceptors here, which is why it's very, very white because you're looking at a lot of myelin here, blood vessels as well. Our center of vision is actually off from the blind spot, and that's why you kind of had to look at a little bit of an angle to, to determine where the blind spot is because our center of vision over here, this fovea and the macula, this is where we have lots and lots of cones which are um, the color photoreceptors. The further and further we get away from the, uh, the fovea, uh, the more uh, and more dense the rod uh, photoreceptors are located. And that's why at night we tend to see in sort of gray scale rather than in color because the center of vision actually has color photoreceptors, but they're less sensitive to light. Turns out rods are much more sensitive to light, but they can't discriminate color. Uh, just a little bit about the pupil. The pupil is just a, a, an aperture designed to regulate the amount of light going in and out. Um, so we see different sizes depending on uh, how much light is or isn't there. There are actually special cells that are designed to control iris diameter by, based on how much light is entering uh, in order to protect the eye in the case of bright situations. Um, and so it modulates light entry. Um, it is a consensual reflex, that is to say both eyes should react equally and with equal uh, amounts. Uh, you know, it's not terribly, you know, uh, bad if, if they don't react equally. However, that is a cardinal sign of an issue if they react equally and then they stop reacting equally. Uh, what you should see is an eye that is unstimulated react the same way as an eye that is stimulated. And that's what we mean by consensual. That is to say you have a, a, a contralateral response that's equal to the, the, um, the, side, uh, the other side that's responding. So the lens is changing in terms of thickness. We change the focal length of the lens in order to accommodate whatever it is that we're looking at. The further away, the more parallel the light beams are and the less we have to bend the light, so it's a thinner lens. If the object is closer, we have to have a thicker lens because the light is coming in at a greater incidence. You can actually experience this firsthand in a phenomenon known as parallax. Uh, parallax is the phenomenon where if you, let's say you're driving along the road and you have uh, objects that are very close to the car, they look like they're zipping by your field of view. Whereas an object way out in the distance, you're moving by those objects out in the distance at the same speed as you are those objects are, that are close. It's just that those objects stay in your field of view much longer. That's because you have differential light ray angles coming into your eye. And I don't want to get too technical about that, but that is the reason why we have to adjust the thickness of the lens is because the angle of the light changes when we're looking at something close.
Our lens is, in fact, a convex lens. Convex means that it's skinny at the outer part of the radius, and it is thicker at the inner part of the radius. Now, this lens is a little bit exaggerated. You could have a very, a very narrow convex lens that doesn't bend light as much, or you could have a thicker convex lens that bends light like crazy. The more it bends the light, the shorter what we call the focal length. That is to say, if you have identical par parallel light rays and you pass them through this convex lens, at some point those light rays are going to converge. If you've ever used a magnifying glass to burn something, what you're doing is you adjust that length of the magnifying glass to whatever it is you're trying to burn so as you get that nice hot spot. That's equivalent to the focal point. Since we're trying to create a reasonable facsimile of whatever it is we're looking at on the retina, focal length becomes very, very important. We have to adjust focal length in order to sustain a crisp image on our retina based on whether or not the light rays are parallel, which is what's happening in a long distance viewing, or if they are not parallel. They tend to be radiating on an object that's near us, and so we need to bend it more in order to keep that into focus. I'll explain that here in the next few slides. If we have a mismatch between the focal length of the lens and the distance to the retina, the image that we project on the retina is going to be blurry. So either we, if when we have mismatches in focal length, that leads to disorders in the eye. And I am going to focus a little bit on disorders, so you need to kind of know what we're talking about. If we talk about myopia or hyperopia, you need to understand the basis for why the image is not in focus. Okay? So a near point will have a radiating situation, and we have to have a thicker lens in order to bend it more so that it's in focus on, on the retina. Now, this image is a little bit off. It's showing the focal point right on the retina like this. That's actually not true, though for brevity purposes, we will depict a lot of the images this way. Okay? Normally, the focal length will be here, and then we get a smaller image on the retina. So this here would cause damage, but it, it's for, con for, for conceptual stay, uh, uh, situations, we're going to depict it a lot like this. Image is inverted on the retina. Again, this is a little bit off. What we would have is converging beams of light. We'd have a focal length out here, and then we would have a smaller upside down image on the retina. Your brain does actually reverse the image. So when you see an upside down image on your retina, your brain flips it over. And there have been some really interesting experiments, probably not permissible anymore. Um, where people have been given special glasses to invert the image, and at first they saw everything upside down, and then eventually their brain actually learned how to flip the image over. Really fascinating stuff. So when they took the glasses off, they saw it upside down again, and then they had to readapt. So probably not permissible in this day and age, but it was an experiment that was done, and we know that that's a phenomenon, that the brain is actually reversing the image in our, in our minds. So from a distance source, we have relatively parallel rays. We, uh, we, we bend the light across a focal length, and if the focal length matches the distance to the retina, we get this beautiful, nice, crisp image. Again, this is not anatom or, uh, physically accurate. Normally, the focal length would be a little bit ahead of it, and then it spreads out, creating a smaller facsimile. One more important point here is that we have to have a flattened lens when we're looking at things distantly. We don't have to bend these parallel light rays very, very much compared to, say, near objects. So when they're near objects, the light is diverging, and we have to bend them a lot more. So for distant objects, our lenses are relatively flat. So when we're looking at objects that are close, with an object that's close, it has a radiating pattern of light beams coming from it. And so we have to bend that light a lot more in order to achieve the proper focal length in the retina. If we don't bend that light, what happens is that the image is blurry because we have a discrepancy between the focal length and the, uh, and the distance to the object. This is where a lot of people spend time in physics. This is why you study optics in physics, is to order, in order to understand how we might correct or how we might adjust proper focus, um, whether it's in our eyes or in other devices.
So when we get, when we have a, a close object, we let that lens thicken and we achieve proper focal length relative to retinal distance. So our lens is thicker when we're looking at near objects and our lens is thinner when we're looking at far away objects. This adjustment between near and far is known as accommodation. We are accommodating our eyes to the distance of the object that we're looking at. So the distance of the object from a far distance, we need to have a flattened lens. When we have a distance to a near one, we have to have a thicker lens. This is known as accommodation. And we looked at this in lab. You looked at very, very small text, and as you brought it closer and closer, there was a point where you could no longer see it in clear focus. That is known as our near point of accommodation. The most common cause of loss of accommodation is when the lens begins to get stiffer to the point that when you uh, try to make it thicker, the lens will not rebound into that thicker um, uh, state. And so you have trouble um, creating a thick enough lens to accommodate the distance of the object. That is known as presbyopia. Presby means elder. So if you're a Presbyterian, you are in the church of the elders, if you will. So presbyopia is the most common cause of what we call hyperopia. That is to say you can see distant objects in focus, or, but you can't see near objects in focus. And so if you have parents or if you have grandparents and you see them looking at a phone or looking at something and they have to kind of hold it further away from them uh, than you would, that's an example of where presbyopia takes place. In presbyopia, we use reading glasses to uh, adjust uh, our ability to accommodate. What we're doing with that is we're making the lens thicker by adding a lens out here, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. So how does accommodation do its thing? Accommodation does its thing because the lens is a relatively, it's a semi-soft material. It can stretch thin or it can rebound and be thick. It's, 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 a, uh, it's a very pliable material. Even in folks that have presbyopia, it still has some stretch. It still has some ability to rebound into a thicker state. Surrounding that uh, lens are a, uh, is a system of ligaments attached to this really wild, circular, smooth muscle called a ciliary muscle. And so it's very much like a trampoline. And so you have this muscle and you have these ligaments suspending this lens. Now we're going to explain how this lens adjusts for focus. When we are looking at something usually above and beyond 35 feet, turns out 35 feet is sort of the default distance that our ciliary muscle sets for. If we are zoning out, if you ever catch yourself zoning out, it turns out that your, that your ciliary muscle moves to a, a position that's roughly equivalent to a 35-foot distant object. In any case, when it's further than 35 feet or so, what's happening is the ciliary muscle is relaxing. In order to flatten the lens, in order to apply more tension, this is the weird thing about it. Usually we think of muscles apply tension by contracting. It's actually the opposite here. Muscle here actually relaxes. That causes the diameter of the ciliary muscle to increase. It gets, becomes a larger donut, and that in turn pulls tension on the lens and flattens it. So when we're looking at distance objects, we're actually relaxing our ciliary muscle pulling tension and flattening the lens. On the other hand, when we're looking at something relatively close, anything closer than 35 feet up to about a few centimeters, you know, 10 to 30 centimeters, we have to contract the ciliary muscle. The, the radius of that muscle decreases as it contracts and that relieves tension on those uh, ligaments and that allows the lens to rebound into a thicker state. So when we are looking at things close, our ciliary muscle is contracting, the lens gets thicker, and we bend the light, the, the light rays more. Um, this is partly why if you've been reading for a while, or if you're looking at your cell phone for a while, your eyes will feel a little tired, because these ciliary muscles can and do fatigue a little bit, 
or it feels like it's a little harder to read, it's a little, you know, lines a little blurrier, that sort of a thing, that's because these muscles are in fact fatiguing. So we thicken the lens to look at things closer, we thin the lens to look at things further away. Now these next couple of slides, I do, I want to talk about these things because myopia is so prevalent in our society, yet some people will resist it to either um, their detriment. Uh, I have had students that have come into class and can't see because they are trying to make a fashion statement by not wearing glasses, and then they their academic performance uh, suffers for it, uh, and, and it can be downright dangerous if for some reason they can't see well enough to do things like drive, much less fly or operate some sort of complex machinery. So I want to talk about how myopia occurs. There are a couple of different ways and how we correct myopia. Why glasses for nearsightedness might be more expensive than say the reading glasses you buy in a drugstore without a prescription. So myopia is when you can see things up close but you have a hard time seeing things far away. So profound implications for driving, profound implications for flying, or for seeing objects in a distance, like for instance in nautical situations, um, in military applications, and so forth. Certainly academics, uh, you have somebody who's a little bit shy, they sit in the back of the room, and they can't see very well, they're afraid to ask questions. It leads to sort of a vicious cycle academically. With myopia, either one of two things occurs. Either the lens is too thick and the focal length is too short, or what's actually more common is that the eyeball gets longer and so the distance to the retina is too long. There are examples of what we call progressive myopia that gets worse and worse. That's where the lens continues to develop more tissue and it gets thicker and thicker over time and so the, the focal length gets shorter and shorter. This is why looking through a Coke bottle is more like a magnifying effect than looking through a window. A window is a lens, it's just that it's very, very flat. Uh, a Coke bottle has a thicker and it's a little more rounded, it's a little more convex, and so it bends the light a little bit more. But again, one of two things, either the lens is too thick or the eyeball is too long. And so now our focal length is out of sync with our eyeball. How do we correct that? Well, we need to weaken the light bending. So if this lens is bending light too much, even if the retina is too far away, the way we correct that is to increase the focal length. And how do we increase the focal length? We use a concave lens. Concave lens, if you look right here, spread the light a little bit. They spread the light out a little bit. They actually are diverging the light beams. So if you look through a concave lens, things will actually look smaller through a concave lens as opposed to a convex lens, which is what we use for magnifying glasses. So we bend the light out a little bit and that restores a proper synchronization with our lens thickness and our retinal distance. That's why when we have um, myopia, we have to get our eyes tested so we get just the right amount of concavity to meet the distance. That's why they test us and that's why you have a prescription. So you get the right synchrony between focal length distance and the distance to the retina. So that's why eyeglasses are more expensive. That's why you have to have a prescription because you gotta get tested, gotta get it just right. Um, if you've ever been tested, you'll see, does this look better or does it look smaller? If it looks smaller, that means that this is a little too strong. If it looks better, it means that we're on the right track. We're getting to a place where it's in more in focus. But if it looks smaller, that means we've gone too far and now we're beginning to go past the ideal focal length. Pretty cool stuff. But it's good to know because then it gives you some knowledge and power and you can help you explain things to your patients if you think they, they might need glasses or your kids or that sort of thing. So concave lenses actually scatter light rays. Convex lenses actually converge light rays. So a concave lens is what we use for people who are nearsighted. Hyperopia, on the other hand, is when the focal length is too long in the lens or for some reason the retinal distance is too short. The most common cause of hyperopia is 
presbyopia, that is the inability to accommodate to a near object. And so what happens is the lens is too thin, and so the light rays don't converge enough, and so the focal point falls behind the retina. So how do we fix that? We use a convex lens that actually bends the light, helps bend the light a little bit more through this lens, and so we bring the focal length right on to, uh, right on to the uh, retina. And that's why reading glasses are so inexpensive and you don't really need a prescription. Uh, really, you just buy the, the ones that uh, help you see well and pay 10 bucks or 20 bucks, depending on how fashion conscious you are. It's bending the light a little bit more. It's assisting this lens in bending light more and so that we match the length to the, uh, the retinal distance. But again, the most common cause of hyperopia is what is known as presbyopia, the stiffening of this age-related stiffening of the, of the lens. So convex lenses that we use to correct hyperopia are bending the light more. And lenses are additive. So if you're bending the light here and then you have another convex behind it, that those guys work together. And that's kind of what we do in a, in a microscope. Uh, we're using pairs of lenses, if you will, to uh, increase the, the, the magnification. Um, in the case of a diverging lens, a, a concave lens, you're actually subtracting the, the focal power. You're making things look smaller. I'm not going to uh, get into astigmatism too much. Astigmatism is typically caused by the cornea where you have uneven thickness or in some cases uneven shape. It's not a perfectly shaped dome. Instead, you have varying thicknesses, sometimes a diversion of shape. Uh, divergence of shape leading to distorted images. You might see something in focus. Um, depending on the aberration, it might be a vertical situation or it might be a horizontal one or a combination therein. Now for our, our final topic in, the, uh, in this chapter, the idea or the concept of phototransduction. This is where we're converting light energy into first graded potentials in our, in our photoreceptors and then action potentials downstream in our axons leading to the central nervous system and then ultimately responses. We have basically three different kinds of photoreceptors. We have our visual photoreceptors known as rods and cones. Um, cones are for color and are a little bit lower sensitivity. Rods are black and white, but are higher sensitivity, and we're going to use this as our model system. Now, there are other cells in the retina that respond to light. Um, they contain a modified photopigment called melanopsin, which uh, uh, control the iris diameter. Um, so these ganglion cells control iris diameter and are responsible for that consensual iral iris response, if you will, uh, in our pupils. The most acute vision is in what we call the fovea and the macula of the, of the retina. This is where you have the densest concentration of cones. This is also where you see a great deal of, of what we called lateral inhibition. That is to say, if you have a strong signal on one, photo, uh, one uh, field of, of reception, receptor field, it will tend to inhibit its neighbors. And that allows us to see more clearly between, like for instance, looking at the text on this image, between the light and the dark. If we didn't have lateral inhibition, we would have a tough time discriminating between light and dark areas on here because we would get partial stimulation uh, in the areas that are not being stimulated by light. We also have a blind spot because there are no photoreceptors there. And again, we measured that or observed that in, in our lab. And here's where our blind spot is located. Here's the macula and the fovea. Again, more cones in this area than rods. The further away we get from that, the more rods we have than cones. So blind spot right here, fovea and macula, again, are most usually our center of vision. Occasionally, you'll see somebody that maybe perhaps has poor controlled diabetes, especially when talking about type 1. You might notice that they will frequently look away from you. Um, what, what's happened is oftentimes they've had what's called retinopathy. And when you have diabetes-related retinopathy, retinopathy uh, sometimes their fovea has lost its acuity. Some of the retina cells have died. And so they have, they have a center of vision that's other than the fovea. And they, um, 
you know, they reflexively will sort of look away from you in order to bring you on to their center of vision. So you might look at that sometime if you have somebody who had juvenile diabetes, they might, you might notice that their center of vision is not the normal uh, center of vision for them. And so you'll see them looking away quite frequently. So we have the retinal cells here. There's a, there's a tissue layer here. Um, what we see is that it's a sort of a reverse distribution that our photoreceptors are actually near the back of the retina. We have this pigmented epithelium uh, that either surround the photoreceptors, sort of envelop it a, a little bit. Um, we have these ganglion cells and some of these other transducing cells. And then on the top, we have these axons projecting into what becomes the optic nerve. So light's actually coming in from the left over here through these cell layers onto our layer of photoreceptors. A little more detailed here. Again, I'm not going to worry about the ganglion cells and the horizontal cells. These guys are involved in either regulating the amount of light coming into uh, the iris, or they're involved in lateral inhibition. So they're involved in that ability to discriminate between light and dark fields that it gives us high acuity vision. So here are our photoreceptors, and they're partially embedded in this uh, pigmented epithelium, RPE, as Katie called it. Um, pigmented epithelium serves to support and um, uh, assist the uh, photoreceptors, first of all, by absorbing light energy. If this light energy bounced off of the pigment epithelium too much, we would get inappropriate photoreception because the light would bounce off, maybe at a little bit of an angle, and now we're causing photoreceptor activation from light that's not coming into the eye, but rather bouncing off other structures. So we absorb a lot of that light energy on the back of the eye in order to, um, to get the crispest vision, visual image as possible. So here's an image of some of our photoreceptors. Again, most of these guys are what we call cones. They have a conical photoreceptor structure. The one that we're going to talk about most are, are rods. Again, these do not discriminate color. They discriminate a gray scale, but they're more sensitive. So rods work well in low light. Um, if you ever like to go out and watch stars at night, uh, what we do is we try to acclimate our eyes so that you can see those little tiny points of light uh, better. Cones are better for higher, higher acuity vision in color, um, but they really are only useful in relatively bright um, fields of light. We do have an experiment in that special senses lab that I do. Uh, sorry we didn't have time to really uh, set that up this week. Not worried about basal segments. Again, these are helping with... Uh, 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 with lateral inhibition, they're also helping with regulate iral, ir, I say iral, iris diameter. Okay. With the rods, the, one of the pigments that we're going to study is called rhodopsin. That's the pigment. This is actually a derivative of vitamin A. The other uh, cones actually have different pigments that are close cousins of rhodopsin, but they are sensitive to different wavelengths. And they are encoded by, you know, the, the metabolism to create them is encoded by specific genes. Um, some of these are found on the, um, on the X chromosome. And so um, men who have, an, uh, have a mutation for certain uh, uh, photo uh, pigments are red, green, colorblind. And it's much more common in men because they only have one X chromosome. If you had two X chromosomes, one may have a good gene and the other one may not, and you'd still have normal vision. So here are our cones here, and they're embedded in this pigmented epithelium. Here are our rods over here. Again, what's going on here, these photoreceptors, is actually these are a lot like chloroplasts. You have these membranous discs that look a lot like thylakoids from our, uh, from our chloroplasts. And in those thylakoids, we have this photopigment that is light sensitive. And that rhodopsin is actually a combination of a protein and that vitamin A derivative known as retinal. And I want you to notice something. I want you to see how this retinal has a little kink in it. That kink is due to a double bond. It's a cis double bond in that kink. So that pigmented epithelium is not only absorbing light energy as it's coming into it, it's very, very dark. In fact, I had a professor that I knew in my graduate department who actually died of melanoma 
melanin is the pigment that is that is secreted or not secreted that is created in the pigmented epithelium and it's it's jet black so if you ever dissect uh, an eye you'll see that the, the pigmented epithelium is very very dark there's loads and loads of melanin and like i said that professor he died of melanoma that was from uh, one of his retinal pigmented epithelial cells in any case the pigmented epithelium also will phagocytose um, old um, discs that are um, that are basically pinched off and exocytosed by the pig by the uh, by the photoreceptors. These photopigments do wear out over time, and so they exocytose these, almost like a slow, um, a slow, just a slow process of releasing. And uh, the pigment epithelium will actually phagocytose those in order to um, to to rid the the retina of that material. But again, these are a lot like thylakoids. The photopigment is embedded in these membranous structures. So what's going on is in dark conditions, this retinal is in cis form. There's a double bond here that's light sensitive. And when it's in this cis form, it associates with this opsin protein. So rhodopsin is a protein, a transmembrane protein in that photoreceptor uh, structure that is associated with retinal. When light strikes that, that, that retinal, that vitamin A derivative, it converts that cis bond into a trans bond. So instead of having this kink here, that bond right here is in a cis configuration. Instead of having this kink, that bond is turned into a trans and then that retinal actually dissociates from the protein. This is why vitamin A is uh, a relatively important um, uh, vitamin to eat in our, in our daily lives. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, so we don't need it every day. We don't need it like vitamin C or vitamin B as often because we don't lose it as rapidly. Nevertheless, there are some situations where if you don't have enough vitamin A, it can lead to visual um, uh, deficiencies. So again, we go from a cis configuration to a trans, then that retinal actually diffuses off of that opsin protein and that leads to phototransduction. Okay, we have a couple of uh, slides left and we're in sort of the most intense part of the um, special senses. And we're going to uh, go through the what we call the phototransduction cascade mechanism. Now, normally I don't, uh, I don't, uh, think that uh, learning all these different mechanisms is terribly important. So that's why we're not learning the metabotropic response for taste or smell um, and so forth. But I do want you to get some experience with signal transduction in special senses. So I chose one. It's our model system. So I don't think it's, 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 it's that hard, but you do have to spend some, a little bit of time on it. Students typically have a tough time on this because they, are, they don't drill down into the figure enough. And so I'm going to spend a ton of time on this figure. Get ready, take good notes, and practice understanding this mechanism because it's the one representative. And I think it will make you stronger when you encounter similar mechanisms in the future. And you will because medicine is moving in this direction. Even if you're not going to be an MD or you're going to be doing something that doesn't involve a lot of pharmacology, having some sense of this will help you become a better patient and make it easier to learn new things in the future. So I am going to have you learn this mechanism show you a relatively interesting connection here for why we might experience certain things in life or near death. That's why I think that this is this one is worth drilling down into. So let's start forward. So one of the issues I've seen is students have trouble interpreting this figure. And so we're going to start over here with a relatively low magnification image. It's still really, really high. But in any case, it's low relative to this figure right here. So we have the photoreceptor. And again, light is coming in from the bottom here in terms of your orientation. But we have two boxes. This box right here is zoomed in for this part of the picture. And this box down here is zoomed in for this part of the picture. Okay? So what's happening here we're going to start in darkness we're going to assume that this photoreceptor is not stimulated by light so here are discs of membranes that have lots of rhodopsin 
and rhodopsin is unbleached at this point. That is to say the retinal molecule has that cis double bond and that retinal molecule is associated with the opsin protein. This opsin protein actually it will interact with transducin, but it will not do so at this time. Okay? At this point, that retinal prevents the opsin protein from interacting with that G protein. Okay? This is like a G protein coupled receptor. Well, what's happening here is that this opsin is being, is being shaped in a way that it can't interact with this G protein. There are some other steps here. I'm going to skip one major step because what happens is transducin is an inhibitor of an enzyme that makes cyclic GMP. So let me get to this again. When transducin is inactive, the cyclic GMP levels in the cell are high. We're missing one enzyme over here. It's a guanylate cycle. Let me get there, okay. In any case, this second message is high when, when light levels are low. So there's an enzyme making cyclic GMP, and these two proteins, if inactivated, cannot inhibit that enzyme. You hear I said that? These guys function to inhibit this enzyme when they are activated by light. So, so, but we're in the dark. So we have cyclic GMP levels, and that in turn causes this channel here. It's called CNG, which stands for calcium sodium GMP sensitive channel. This is a ligand gated channel that is a SIM porter allowing calcium and sodium to enter the cell. Okay. Calcium and sodium are entering the cell when the GMP levels are high, which is in the dark. Okay, work through that. If you can get that, then you can get the rest of this. Okay. This channel is open when we're in the dark, so, uh, calcium and sodium move in. It causes depolarization of the membrane of this cell. Now there are other channels involved and there's this potassium. This is a distraction. We're not gonna worry about potassium. We're gonna keep this as simple as humanly possible, shall we say, or dare I say. In any case, this channel is open and calcium and sodium are coming in. Why is the channel open? Because the, uh, the GMP levels are high. That leads to lots and lots of neurotransmitter being released. We're depolarized, we're above threshold, we're releasing neurotransmitter when we're in the dark. I think that's really, really interesting. So now let's move to a light condition. So light comes in and it's not coming in here, it's coming in from down here through the iris of the eye, striking the retina. And what happens is it converts that photon of light will convert that cis double bond in retinal to an all trans double bond. That retinal can no longer stay on the opsin and the cascade ensues. So the retinal diffuses off, the opsin binds to this transducin, the tra transducin inhibits the enzyme that makes GMP. It inhibits the enzyme that makes cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP drops and the channel closes. Okay, so this no longer lets calcium in, it no longer lets sodium in. The membrane repolarizes to minus 70 and we stop secreting neurotransmitter. That's really wild and this is where you can make the connection. If you watch a movie and you can watch almost anything or on TV or so forth, if you see somebody who is in a near-death experience you know, through their eyes, like you're looking through their eyes, they're about to die or they're in the process of dying. Or if you see the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, they're all examples. Hollywood's done a really, really good job of integrating what we have observed in people with near-death experiences. What I mean to say is when people are at or near dying, they tend to see a very, very bright light. Well, exocytosis requires ATP. So we are actually hydrolyzing a lot of ATP here in order to exocytose. Well, when somebody is near dying, what's happening to these cells? They may be deprived of oxygen. They can't make ATP. So neurotransmitter amounts will diminish. So if you don't have ATP, you perceive a bright white 
light. So if you watch the movies, they fade to white as opposed to fade to black. And that makes perfect sense. Why? Because we can't, uh, we can't exocytose this neurotransmitter. And so these near-death experiences are experienced as a bright white light, not as a darkness. I think that's a really, really interesting way to, un to remember the basics of this mechanism. But if you remember that in near-death experiences, we don't have a lot of ATP, we perceive light. Well, we don't, can't exocytose if we don't have ATP. Okay. Now, after we have exposed our eyes, you know, if you've come in from a, a, a light environment and you can't see for a little bit, Part of that's because your rods in your eye have been photobleached and they need to regenerate. So your pigmented epithelium and there are enzymes in the photoreceptor as well will convert that retinal or that retin that transretinal back into a cisretinal and it will reassociate with the opsin. So now the opsin can no longer interact with this transducin. We start making GMP again, we let calcium in, and we start exocytosing again. So that period of time when you go into some place from outside, when it's been very, very bright, and your, light, and your eyes are adapting to the dark, that's your pigmented epithelia and um, your photoreceptors regenerating that cis-retinal. Again, it's a, it's a little bit complex. There's a little bit of distraction here with the potassium. Don't worry about that. There, it's more complicated. It always is. But I want you to think opsin and retinal, rhodopsin, does not interact with the transducin, does not stop the GMP. GMP is high, lets calcium sodium in, and we get exocytosis. Light comes, it knocks off that retinal, it's now trans. The opsin can bind to the transducin. That inhibits GMP, cyclic GMP production. The channel closes, we repolarize the membrane, and we stop secreting neurotransmitter. When we go back into a dark condition or a darker condition, the pigmented epithelia and the, the, the photoreceptors will, uh, will metabolize that retinal back into a cis retinal. It'll reassociate with opsin, and then we have high GMP levels and more neurotransmitter. So a really, really cool mechanism if you make those connections, but you have to make those connections. So we spent like 10 minutes on this slide. That means you need to spend a lot of time working through this. I would actually take a piece of paper and cover up parts of this so that you can sort of animate this on your own and work through it. But the key is to work through this cascade right here and right here. This box is showing the distal end of the cell, how much exocytosis is occurring. And remember, exocytosis requires ATP. And I mentioned this, I'm just reinforcing it. Again, I'm not worried about the amacrine and horizontal cells and the ganglion cells here. Again, lots and lots of um, uh, lateral inhibition going on here in order to increase the ability to discriminate between light and dark. This is lateral inhibition in spades, only we can see it in the neural architecture. Uh, here they show it as one neuron with lots of projections. Well, that's exactly what this is right here. Look at this neuron. You can see that it has lots of foot processes. And so you can cause inhibition in order to prevent an inappropriate signal in areas which are not directly stimulated. It increases the acuity of the localization phenomenon. You can see this in your tips of your fingers, on the surface of your lips, and you can also especially see it in your eyes. People who do not have the ability to, to, um, to laterally inhibit have a tougher time discriminating light and dark areas, particularly when they're reading. And so this concludes chapter 10. We are completed. Again, we have a lot going on here. We spent a lot of time in this chapter, almost uh, you know, a week and a half, nearly two weeks. So this is a big chapter. There's a lot going on here because so much of the human experience centers around sensory perception. Loss of perception, inappropriate perception uh, are all major aspects of pathology and pathophysiology. Inappropriate pain, 
uh, or or there's those types of things are all major aspects of the symptomology that we observe in patients and clients and people we care about. That's why I spend so much time on this chapter. I hope uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this and uh, good luck and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.